In this module, we're talking about student motivation. On screen, you'll see a, a number of motivations that students might bring with them uh, to the classroom or, or might find along the way. Learning is not just a cognitive process. It's also an affective one. Uh, the motivations that students have or find uh, will, uh, in a large way, determine their success in our, in our STEM programs. And so, as instructors, it's important that we attend to student motivation and do what we can to kind of foster the motivations that will lead to students uh, being successful. Now, you can see a lot of different kinds of motivations on the screen right now, and, and in fact, our students do bring a variety of motivations. Uh, their motivations might not be the ones that we had when we were in their position, and so it's important to think about the different kinds of motivations that students have. The research on student motivation tends to categorize most of them in these kind of broad categories, uh, intrinsic motivations and extrinsic motivations. Intrinsic motivations are the ones that we kind of bring with us, um, a love of learning, um, interest in mastering a subject, the reward that comes at the end of something like that. Extrinsic motivations are external to us, grades, parental pressures, uh, the, the, the job or the graduate school that we'll get when we're, when we're done with the program. Uh, the thing about intrinsic motivations is they tend to be more powerful, um, but a little less under our ability to influence as instructors. Extrinsic motivations tend to be a little less powerful, um, but again, we can actually generally control those fairly well. When we say something like, this will be on the test, or if you want to get an A in this course, here's what you need to do, we're activating those extrinsic motivations. Now, Ken Bain has this book, What the Best College Teachers Do, and uh, he talks about this literature on motivation and makes the claim that uh, these two different kinds of motivations um, generate certain types of learning behaviors in students. He calls one type of behavior strategic learning. These are the extrinsically motivated students who are typically either after a certain grade or scared of getting a certain kind of grade. Either way, they tend to fall back in what Ken Bain calls strategic learning behaviors. They will do just enough to get that grade or avoid that grade, but no more. Uh, they, uh, they might not learn very deeply. They might not learn in a way that will help them solve problems when they leave the course. Uh, they'll do what they need to to kind of navigate the course itself and get whatever external reward that they want. Ken Bain contrasts these, these students with deep learners. Uh, these are the students who are interested in learning, maybe not for its own sake, but at least they're interested in mastering the learning, figuring out what they can take from this course to, uh, to solve problems down the way, um, to, to use in future courses or their, their careers. Uh, this is the kind of deep learning that we'd really like students to be able to develop. The problem is that it's really hard work. Deep learning requires a fairly high level of motivation. Uh, and often that means extrinsic, uh, excuse me, intrinsic motivations. So the challenge for us as instructors, I think, is how can we try to foster some of those intrinsic motivations uh, to motivate students towards the kind of deep learning that we'd like them to have. Now, uh, there's a few tools in the literature uh, that I think we can use. And so um, I'm, I'm quoting a lot from Ryan and Desi here. Um, uh, they've got a really nice summary of some of the, the research on student motivation. They point to a few different factors that are at play with intrinsic motivations. One is this idea of competence. So uh, the visual here is of, uh, of a, a puzzle. And um, I have a young daughter, and, and uh, she's kind of attuned to the size of a puzzle piece in a box of uh, a puzzle that she might get and how many pieces there are in that. If there's too few pieces and if the pieces are too big, it's not very interesting to her anymore. But if there's too many pieces or the pieces are too small, it's a little too challenging for her, and she doesn't want to do that either. She's looking for something that's kind of just right. And that's the idea behind competence. We're motivated when we're engaging in tasks that are hard but not too hard. If it's too hard, we disengage, we get frustrated. If it's too easy, it's not interesting enough. And so this is one piece of the puzzle, I think, so to speak, that, uh, that we can use to try to uh, structure some more motivation in students. There's also the idea of autonomy. Um, this, again, is a photo from my, my kids. Um, I, I know when my daughter got her bike with the training wheels and she could kind of go off and, and have a little bit of autonomy, um, uh, direct her own path, she was really excited. And that's what the research on motivation says, that when we have a certain degree of autonomy, we're more motivated to engage in whatever the, the activity is. We don't really like it when people are telling us exactly what to do. We want to have some choice, some free will in that, and that's a motivating factor. A third category is this idea of purpose. We're motivated when we know why it is we're doing what we're doing and what the end is. What's the goal? What can I do with this? Uh, students don't always 
know quite precisely why they're taking a particular math or science or engineering course. Uh, they take it because the, the major requires it and they're, they're there, but they're not quite sure what it's good for. Um, I'll often uh, talk about uh, students uh, trying to help them understand in a math course what they can do with the math. How, what kind of problems can it help them solve? What, what, what are they going to do with this when they finish the course? Um, that's tapping into this idea of purpose so that they know kind of what it is that they're all about. More recent research uh, looks at some other aspects of motivation, what I would call social motivations. There was a study by Binkler and Nissenbaum that came out a few years ago that looked at uh, different groups of individuals, but one of the groups I know they looked at were um, contributors to Wikipedia. So these were people who frequently made edits or, or uh, contributions to Wikipedia. And the researchers were interested to know why did these folks participate in Wikipedia when there wasn't any real financial reward for doing so. And what they found was, among the Wikipedians and other groups as well, is that people are strongly motivated by being part of a community and by contributing and sharing with that community. And so the image here, I'm drawing a lot from my kids here. Um, this is one of my kids' soccer teams in action. Um, and, and I think you know, our, our classrooms aren't necessarily, well, they're not soccer teams, and they're not necessarily learning communities either, but they can be. And when we start to help students see their classmates as people they can learn from and learn with, we're tapping into this idea of building a learning community. And again, that's going to motivate students to, to engage. Um, I like to think that I, I may not, um, I may have trouble motivating my students to, to want to know math, but they might actually like the learning process. They might like learning with these people, and that's something that we can use to our advantage. So in terms of strategies, if you want to um, kind of inhibit the strategic learners uh, and try to kind of shift their attention away from the grades and the rewards, um, often it's helpful to lower the stakes in some, in some way. So this may mean giving students multiple opportunities to show what they know. Um, not having one giant test at the end of the semester that everything's riding on, that's going to really focus their attention on that grade and not on the learning process as you go. So having multiple smaller tests along the way, giving students opportunities to um, show what they know in different ways perhaps. Uh, maybe their final assignment is a paper or a poster. Um, giving students the opportunity to revise and resubmit. Um, I found a lot of success with having students do corrections on tests after they get them back. Uh, it could be that you build a little slack in the system. So maybe you assign 10 problem sets over the course of the semester. Students get to drop one of them. Those are all uh, techniques that will um, help to lower the stakes a little bit. Now, we have to be realistic. We're not going to remove the stakes entirely. Um, at least in uh, most uh, higher education systems, students get a grade at the end of the semester, and that grade really does have some meaning. It's going to affect um, where they go to grad school, what kind of jobs they get, whether or not they finish the program. Um, those things are not unimportant, uh, but I think there are things we can do to try to lower those stakes a little bit to take some of the pressure off so that students can focus a little bit more on learning. One of the most important things we can do in this category is not grading on the curve. Uh, when, we are, um, when we say things like only 10% you know, of you are going to get A's and the next 20% are going to get B's and, and that's it, what we've done is we've set up a very competitive classroom environment. And for most students, that's going to shift them from, those, um, from deep learning strategies to strategic learning strategies. Uh, and so that's a, that's a real way to raise the stakes and not lower the stakes. Better to say, here's what it needs, here's what you have to be able to do in order to get an A and see how many students can reach that bar. Now, in terms of those intrinsic motivators, there are strategies we can use to try to leverage those as well. So again, we're looking at um, competence and autonomy and purpose and community. So uh, when it comes to competence, this is kind of the Goldilocks effect, right? You want something that's not too hard and not too easy. So this involves knowing where your students are, what they, what they bring with them to the course, what they find challenging, what they don't find challenging, and trying to kind of pitch the course, pitch your activities and assignments at the right level so that students are challenged, but it's not so overwhelming that they give up. In terms of autonomy, when you can give students some choice, um, either in maybe a, a topic they get to explore for a project, or maybe it is in kind of the format of, of what they report. Maybe some students would prefer a presentation to a poster or a paper. Um, or maybe it's just giving students some choice in how they earn participation points in a particular course. Those are strategies you can use to give students a little bit more autonomy um, so that they have a little bit more control over kind of how they navigate the course and show their learning. And most of them will find that really motivating. 
um, the, the paper topic selection, I, uh, it can be really helpful to get, have students kind of connect, um, connect your course with things that they're interested in. And that brings us to the idea of purpose. Uh, helping students see why they're in this course, what it can do with them, what it can do for them, um, helping them understand kind of what the connections are between their personal and professional and vocational interests and this course can be really powerful. So pointing them to the kinds of things they can do with your course material um, when they leave the course. Also, I think there's another aspect of this that uh, sometimes students feel there's not a lot of purpose in what they're doing in the class because they're just taking these tests or doing these projects and turning them in and then moving along um, with their lives. Uh, one technique that can be um, kind of interesting is having a, some type of authentic audience for students' work. So maybe you have students take some complex ideas and explain them for a kind of lay audience uh, through some YouTube videos. Right? Um, that can be a really challenging process for students, but knowing that they're going to share their results with a, a real audience out there in the World Wide Web it can be really motivating, and they can take the, the work very seriously. Or maybe um, uh, uh, you engage your students in some type of service learning project where they're applying the skills that they're learning in your course for um, community organizations that, that, that need different types of assistance or help, um, and that the service is valuable to them, but also a really good learning experience for your students. Um, maybe it's just having an external client for a project, right? This is a, a fairly common strategy in engineering courses, particularly senior design courses, having students do work for external clients that are really interested in what they have to come up with. All of that can increase the level of purpose in the assignments in your courses that you give students. Finally, there's this idea of community um, and trying to create a learning community among your students. Again, it's not necessarily going to happen, actually. Just because you've got a bunch of people in the room doesn't mean that they form a learning community. Um, you've got to do what you can to help them get to know each other. Um, give them opportunities to share what they know with each other, um, to, to share their own interests with each other, so that they can start to see that they can, in fact, learn from each other. So I'm going to end with one example from my own classroom practice that I think it illustrates at least a few of these principles. And it's an activity I've done in a couple of different courses um, that I would, I would call social bookmarking. And so. Um, I started in, in my cryptography course a couple of years ago doing this. Um, I found that students were coming to this course with lots of different interests in the course. Some of them liked the codes and the ciphers. Some of them liked the puzzle solving. Some of them liked the mathematics. Some of them liked the history and the espionage aspects of cryptography. Others were interested in kind of modern day computer security and encryption technologies. And so what I had them do was I had them use this kind of shared site where they were bookmarking, kind of saving links to uh, news articles and websites and resources that they had found that appealed to them. And I think this, was, this worked really well for this course in part because the students were fairly well motivated already, right? They, they were, they, this was a small course. They had a lot of options for this, this course. And, and so they, they all had some kind of interest in cryptography. But since they were connecting their individual interests with resources that they shared with the entire course, both online and during class, we would take a fair amount of class time each week and pull up some of these um, examples and stories and, 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 and discuss them as a class, I think they started to see each other as people they can learn from, right? That, that we were kind of in this together, um, learning together, um, sharing what we were finding out with each other. And, and so I think that's pretty powerful. Um, I tried this again in my statistics course. That was a very different course. I had 70 students who um, largely were taking it because it was a required course. Um, in that case, I wanted them to start to see the relevance of statistics to um, things that they were interested in, to their careers, to their majors. And so I, I had them find different types of resources, but I still wanted them to, to go and find examples of statistics in action and share that back with the class. And that worked reasonably well, not quite as well as with the cryptography students. Um, but I think in all of these cases, um, I'm giving them a task that's actually not too hard. It may be a, a little too easy on the, on the uh, competence scale, actually. It's a pretty, pretty low barrier to entry to find a website with something interesting and share it with your classmates. Um, but it certainly tapped into the kind of autonomy and purpose ideas. Um, students could kind of go in lots of different directions with this, find different types of resources or different topics. And I encouraged them to try to tap into things that they were already interested in so they could start seeing the connections between our course material and those interests. And I think it also served to help create this learning community feel, where students saw that they could actually learn from each other and build on um, the resources and examples that their peers shared.
Now, this isn't the only way to uh, foster student motivation. And so in the videos that follow, you'll see some interviews with faculty in a few different fields talking about the teaching strategies they've used and found successful in motivating students. As you listen to these interviews, look for these four ideas, competency, autonomy, purpose, and community, and see how the teaching choices that these faculty made tapped into these ideas to leverage student motivation. Thank you.